This is Robbie Johnson with the Raleigh Architecture Company, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Modernism Week in Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a huge architecture and design festival. And for the last five years, U.S. Modernist has been there interviewing nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers, plus special guests at the U.S. Modernist Compound, a.k.a. Poolside, at the very swanky Hotel Skylark. Today, in our second show on architecture movies, George Smart talks with filmmaker Valentina Geneva, who's working on a new documentary about L.A. architect Rudolf Schindler. Then he talks to art director Jeanine Oppewall, the production designer behind films such as L.A. Confidential, filmed in Neutra's Lovell House. And then Paula Benson of Film and Furniture visits with George, discussing the real Hollywood film stars, the chairs and the rugs and the sofas. This year at Modernism Week, I really enjoyed going to the Palm Springs Art Museum. Went there last year, and again this year because they're completely different exhibits. It's right in the middle of everything else at camp. And it's just a really cool museum in its own right. And camp, if you're curious, is this giant tent they set up just for Modernism Week. It's a cafe. It's an information center. It's a lecture hall. It's demonstration things by various sponsors of Modernism Week. It's, it's enormous. But it's a central place you can go to always get information and tickets and know what's going on. It's a, quite an operation. Yeah. And it's right next to the art museum. If you are into mid-century modern, Modernism Week is a fabulous festival of mid-century architecture, amazing parties at incredible modernist houses, brilliantly curated exhibits, nonprofit benefit events at night, architecture documentary premieres that you won't see anywhere else, and much more. For me, always one highlight, since we don't have these in North Carolina or many places around the country, is making a pilgrimage to the In-N-Out Burger. It's it like burger heaven. Yeah. And they only have about eight things on the menu. So you have to know that there's a secret menu for In-N-Out Burger, which you can look up very easily on the internet. Right. And it has about 18 more things, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I think more than that. Yeah. Okay. And of course, everything on the secret menu, the staff knows completely. They're used to this. But it's a kind of a little thrill to place your order when your order is not up on the board. That's part of the whole gimmick. And if you're going to go, go early, because by the time the place opens at 1030 every morning, there's a line there by 11 o'clock every day. And that line doesn't go away generally until late at night. So plan your trip accordingly. If you'd like to go with us to Modernism Week in Palm Springs in February 2021 and stay with us at the U.S. Modernist Compound, email me at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Nietzscheha.com slash U.S. Modernist and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In her ongoing fictional life, resourceful Angela Roll was out of money on the streets of Paris. She only had five trusted friends, Jada, a computer expert, Alme, an expert at makeup and disguises, Yonat, an acrobat and former Mossad agent, Baby G, a former adult entertainer turned rapper, and her Aunt Jennifer, who made lunch. Angela managed to mastermind a midnight heist from a Pan Am 747 at Charles de Gaulle Airport, stealing a rare limited edition Banksy in her bright yellow Mini Cooper S, John Cooper Works edition. Days later, driving through the streets of Monte Carlo, she was chased by Interpol detective Eric Von Roll and his twin brothers Kaiser and Chibata Roll, (laughs) who nearly captured her. But she escaped by jetpack, because all heroines have one, and came to America to become a real estate agent specializing in modernist houses. Now Angela advises buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to turning off that annoying shredding feature on your bank seat. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call her at 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Today in our second Modernism Week episode on architecture movies, 
I talk with filmmaker Valentina Geneva, who is working on a new documentary about L.A. architect Rudolf Schindler. And later, I talk with art director Janine Oppowal, the genius behind the sets of such films as L.A. Confidential, which was filmed in Richard Neutcher's Lovell House some 26 years ago. Plus, she worked for eight years for the husband and wife team of Charles and Ray Eames. That's pretty cool. Let's go now and chat with Valentina Geneva in Palm Springs. Thank you for coming and visiting with us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I first encountered you, I think, in the early stages of fundraising for your new film about Schindler, yes. which is fascinating. So how long have you been working on this? Well, actually, I have been working on this film since 2012. So it's a long time. It's a long process. It started as a small project, and then I got very ambitious, and I decided that I really want to do a, a full biographical film on Schindler because I felt like that he's still not uh, that much understood and that he's not just uh, enough appreciated. I even was today, yesterday, I went to the library at the Museum of Architecture here in Palm Springs, right, to see the show. Yes. And then I go into the little gift gift store there, right, and I look at the books and and there is, like, a book on everybody there. Frank Lloyd Wright, Neutra, Philip Johnson, you know, it's like you name it. But Schindler is not there, you know? Really? Yeah, there is no one book that they sell on Schindler. So I was like, wow, this is like... I really feel that he's really still just uh, not enough, you know, taken seriously, maybe. I don't know what it is, but um, he's definitely, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating modernists. And he has left us an incredible well of ideas and it's been always forefront. And it's just, um, I think it's really a shame. Well, he was one of the, the first to die, really, of that generation. I mean, he died in 53, which was yes. way before all the other ones started to pass away. It's true. Wright died yeah. in 59. Yeah. Neutcher died in 70. Yeah. And um, we haven't quite picked up as much on his celebrity as we have some of the other ones, except in L.A. L.A. is pretty good about celebrating Schindler. Yes, I guess that's it. <laughs> but, but he hasn't reached that kind of national prominence no. yet. He hasn't. He hasn't. And and that kind of became my obsession of like making a film where really to delve into his philosophy, into his architecture, to be like a really a very comprehensive view into it. Mm-hmm. Because I can't even describe you how many times I would tell people I'm doing film on Schindler and they would say, oh yeah, he's part of the Bauhaus and uh, Neutra. And I'm like, no, he's not part of the Bauhaus. Actually, he spent his entire life trying to explain you know, why his kind of architecture, which was he called space architecture, was like more, how shall I say, it's, it's the thing that's really, it's more humane, it's something that, you know, it's really more needed for, for people to feel better and to, you know, for their own, like, inner growth and so on, versus, like, putting everybody in boxes and so on. So I think, you know, it really needs to be explained, you know, where he really was standing compared to the others. Schindler was an author as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I believe he had something, what is called the 12-point program that he put together of his principles of design. It was his, maybe you're talking about his manifesto? Yes. Okay, yes, yes. yes. That's something he wrote very early when he was still a student in Vienna, like, and uh, it's just amazing that it's something that really lays all the foundations of everything he did later on, you know, and kind of followed, because... Even though he was very eclectic in a way his architecture looks from one period to another, the principles are very similar, uh, spatial principles. They tied, you know, all those different periods in his life that visually are different, and yet they're very connected. And it all starts there in that manifesto. And I know at various points of his life he was on a lecture tour talking about this manifesto. Um, Yes, he did a lot of lectures because he felt like people really didn't understand what he was trying to do, and he was always trying to explain that. He was touring and um, did a lot of lectures on the idea of space architecture, which is basically now building from inside out, building with the idea of what the person really tailored to the person that the house is built for. So it's more like, almost like a miniature psychological portraits of the homeowner, where you kind of, you know, really build the environment in mind with the needs of that person and in mind with the way that person maybe will develop in future. So it, there is like all that already it's thought about 
in the design from the very beginning. So let's talk about one of his most famous houses, the King's Road House. Yes. Where he lived. I'm sure you know a lot about that now. <laughs> yes. How did he come to design that house and ultimately live in it and ultimately have a very interesting set of roommates? Mm, yes, yes. Well, you know, once he came to Los Angeles because uh, he was working on Frank Boyd Wright's um, Hollyhook house, and then um, still kind of debating, should he go back to Europe or stay here? And then they went on a trip to Yosemite with his wife, and he absolutely fell in love with the nature, with California. And uh, the way they live there, like in the forest, in a little tent, naked. There's even pictures of uh, Shinro naked by the river, like uh, uh, up in Yosemite. He was the original <laughs> bohemian. I mean, yes, he, he was. was just, he, he was, was totally was. into it. I he was. The he only was. time I was at Yosemite was in the winter. <laughs> Well, there is a picture of him naked by the river, and, and I him. guess, yeah, I guess they kind of went native there, you yeah. know, in some way, and they felt like he felt that, oh, you know, I could make this place, you know, where we could just live in commune with nature, because you could do this in California. You cannot do this really in Vienna. <laughs> you know, the nakedness in Vienna doesn't go over well. No, it doesn't. Only in France it and Italy. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think before the nakedness, they play a little Strauss. Yeah, well, that's yeah. a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you that something interesting is going to happen. Yeah, right yeah. yeah. And then, you know, Pauline, she was a very radical in her own way, you know. She was a Smith graduate with a very, like, you know, liberal ideas. And she actually, it's a famous letter she wrote to her mother back uh, when she was saying she wanted one day to have a place that's open to all the people from all walks of life. And kind of, um, he created that space for her, you know, in some way. Uh, they kind of merged their both ideas and it became this uh, bohemian hub that was, you know, where you really live in um, oh. openness to nature and the architecture actually promotes openness between the relationships between people because now you have this uh, basically, you know, a duplex uh, in nowadays because it was made for two couples, the chair kitchen, the, the living rooms are the gardens. They sleep in, a, you know, sleeping porches outside almost right under the stars. And the house was uh, always open for all different kinds of people, from artists, politicians, uh, rich people, poor people, bohemians, uh, it was Galka really a Shire. Hub. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you think of the fact that Galka Shire, when she was living there, she was a doer for the Boo Four, Kandinsky, uh, Klee, uh, Feininger, and Yavlansky, she had uh, those paintings hanged on the walls in the guest studio in the King's Road house, <laughs> which nobody wanted to buy at that time. <laughs> right. It's like, what are these things? Yeah. yeah. I can put them on the wall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And she actually called Schindler the honorary five. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, you know, because she felt that uh, he was right up there with the four that she was representing. So tell us about Schindler's housemates. Um, okay, well, housemates, uh, well, there were the chases in yes. the beginning. The wives were classmates at uh, Smith, so that's how they started the whole thing. Uh, and then there was, uh, but, you know, kind of that communal lifestyle didn't work very well for them. <laughs> The both women have babies right after the house was built, and it suddenly become kind of the reality hit in. <laughs> it wasn't that easy to live that way. And then the chases moved out, and then uh, different people came through the house at different times. The Neutras lived there as well in 1925 when, yes. when they arrived. And that didn't work very well either because <laughs> they were also very different people. Like They were much more kind of... Um, I wouldn't say, like, straight, but maybe that's the right word. <laughs> they, they were more conservative than the Schindlers, for sure. Yeah, and Dione felt like, oh, my God, you know, she just couldn't. Uh, she was a very kind of shy person, and Pauline was a little bit, like, always making fun of her. Uh, for being uh, for, uptight. Uh, for being too positive, actually. Oh, for being too positive. <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> like, oh. And uh, poor Diana, I guess she was somehow, you know, ahead of its time because now being too positive is a really good thing, right? Well, it comes and goes. <laughs> it's it an comes advantage. And goes. <laughs> yeah. So there were all these, like, kind of problems. And then, the, um, yeah, the other people were, uh, there were, like, different artists that lived there at some point. Um, 
Dudley Moore lived there, okay. I think. And um, I mean, John Cage came came through. They were like the composer. A lot of yes, okay. yes, with his uh, yeah. He actually lived there at the guest studio for a while. Mm-hmm. John Cage had an affair with Pauline Schindler. Uh, <laughs> there were a lot of affairs going on there, I understand. <laughs> yes, it's a combination yes, of yes. European and yes, California yes, here. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And he was at that time 28 years old, uh, younger than her when they had an oh. affair. Yes. Well, that, that was that very was, avant-garde. Then. Yeah, but that was when Pauline was already out of the house, actually. You okay. know, she left the King's Road house in 1925. For like seven years, she was traveling up and down the coast, and she was the editor of the um, Carmelite, which is a little liberal publication in Carmel, where she lived. And uh, she was part of all that scene there with Edward Weston and, you know, all the artists that were coming and going and giving lectures and arranging lectures for Neutra and Schindler to do, even though she was not with Schindler anymore. Um, It was a very kind of an open... uh, Mm-hmm. Um, kind of flow of relationships between all of these people, and uh, and the amazing thing is that they all stayed friends. Like Pauline was a very good friend with Ellen Johnson, who was basically the other most important right. relationship in Schindler's life. In the uh, South, we call this a menage a trois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They didn't really have that, but <laughs> a little bit of that. Because I think Schindler just was really once uh, the, the the relationship between Schindler and Pauline really was very sour because I think she had some problems, mm-hmm. um, kind of psychological problems, and he they really were as marriage said uh, she was the only woman he didn't kept friends with after. They, after it was over. Yeah, right. after it was over. Like, he was friends with all his other women friends, and they were friends, but not Pauline. That, that, like, really, there was a very sore point. And according to Mary, part of it was because she was so, so, so possessive of Mark yes. and kind of deprived Schindler from relationship with Same his with son. Mark, with his son, Yeah, yes. yeah. So there was kind of a lot of there. So even when she went back to live in the King's Road house, she lived at the Chase uh, apartment, they would live next to each other, but they would not communicate. They would communicate with letters. Oh. <laughs> How civilized. <laughs> Very civilized. His will always start with dear, on, mad- dear madam. <laughs> dear madam. <laughs> on stationery, perhaps? Yes, yes absolutely. Oh, yes. <laughs> absolutely. Penmanship was absolutely. Ag- required here, Tom. Yeah, about. yeah, yeah. And as Mary said, somehow they shared the dog. So they both oh. took care of the dog somehow. I don't know. But that they was would the not. Ambassador. Right. I right. guess so, yeah. But they would not really communicate with each other. So now, In your film, mm-hmm. what are some of the places that you visited that Schindler designed that people can look forward to seeing? Well, actually, a lot of places. And that was one of the things, really, why one of the reasons why the film has taken so long to do because it's, you know, expensive to put together all these shoots. And, and Schindler's architecture is particularly difficult to photograph because it's not just like, you know, four walls, like the way the international style is a very kind of, you know, um, uh, surfaces where it's like easy to have a, a one shot and get, get the idea. With Shinra, it's all about unfolding spaces. It's all these little, you know, areas, and you can really get the feeling of it just by putting the camera straight. So this would be something better suited for a moving camera. A moving camera. Sort of explore a space. Or, yes, a moving camera or kind of a dolly shots where you can mm-hmm. kind of, you know, follow the kind of the lines and kind of see it. But so anyway, that was really kind of very challenging thing. And I had, I was very lucky to have a very good uh, director of photography, Jacek Laskos, who is an mm-hmm. ASC, Polish uh, cinematographer. And we kind of had a really good cameras and um, managed to capture some of that stuff very well, the architecture. So places we filmed, um, starting with the King's Road House, and then in um, in Los Angeles, it will be like uh, the Howe House, uh, several houses in Silver Lake, uh, Walker House, Wilson, Droste, the Rodriguez House, which is famous with um, being in the Pineapple Express film movie. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> People are always curious about that place. Uh, the Buck House, um, which was also one of the most famous um, houses Shinra designed in the 30s, which mm-hmm. uh, was kind of the closest one to the international style, which was the you know main modernism kind of trend that was happening at the time. Also in uh, the Lavelle Beach House, which is really an amazing uh, oh, yes. house that's in Newport Beach. And uh, we were very lucky to have it 
to be open for us to film there. The Pueblo Ribera Court in La Jolla, which yes. is also like a wonderful oh, yes. example of Schindler doing um, 12 units. And it's just, it's a very interesting space. And then uh, in Los Angeles, also from the 40s, like, like all the different periods, basically, of his architecture covered. So from the 40s, we have the Kelly's house. From the 50s, the Tischler house, the Lechner house. So it's a really a very comprehensive view of his architecture through all the different um, stages, starting from the concrete period of the 20s, the plaster skin of the 30s, and then the experiments in the 40s with the Schindler frame and the translucent houses. Now, have you wrapped up production for everything, or you're still shooting? I pretty much, as far as like architecture is done, I think I'm done. <laughs> I wanted to create a little bit of a transitional moments, kind of a fake archives without being a recreation, just yes. shooting with Super 8 and 16 camera okay. and creating like a little snippets of in the King's Road house, particularly things that look like it could be from back then to do connect have, with photos. Yeah, do you have period footage? Uh, there is only, I discovered, which is actually before never has been seen, the only existing footage of Schindler, which is from the late 40s. He's at the King's Road house, and it's oh. just one shot of him with the dog huh. in the yard of the King's Road Probably house. A camera shot? I don't know. Maybe just nobody really... You probably just haven't found them yet because I know the people in that era were really into video. I, th- they, they I would really, have their little cameras yeah. and they would be shooting each other. You mean movies? Yeah, it well, was before video. See, I found the footage of Neutra, you know, in the King's Road house. I have that from the 20s. Mm-hmm. And Schindler was there and Pauline was there, but they're not on that film. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it's just Neutra's. Yeah, and it's in the King's Road house. It's in 1925, and Neutra is wearing actually the same outfit that he wears on the famous picture of both of them in the King's Road house. Nope. So it was really when they arrived and, you know, and at the beginning, you know, of staying at the King's Road house in the 20s. So there was no really any footage of Schindler, you know, that I have been able to discover and that anybody knows, actually, except the one I finally found in this architectural film from the 70s called Architecture West, that actually Esther McCoy was involved with that movie as well in some ways. So well, um, I can give you a hint where you might find it. Yeah? We've interviewed or talked to, I've talked to so many filmmakers. Uh-huh. It seems like the tr- trick is to find the last girlfriend. <laughs> And she has a closet that is full of this stuff, (laughs) usually the videos and some slides and things like that. This was true of Albert Frey here Uh on the mountain. uh He was with a woman for the last uh, 10 years of his life. Mm -hmm. Uh, She was a yogini, and they came across each other on the mountain one day. She kind of nursed him back to health, and they became a couple. And then after he died, she moved away, and the documentary filmmaker who was doing the two Frey films, Uh found her and found these boxes, boxes (laughs) worth of this video, which Uh has been, you know, meticulously restored and updated. And so in the premiere of the film this week, we got to see footage of him that had uh-huh. never, ever seen the light of day since mm-hmm. it was shot. So maybe the old girlfriend will well, have it. Well, the, with the girlfriend, this is how far I got, because the last girlfriend or in which house he actually died, and she, she has been his girlfriend through all his life, uh, Ellen Johnson. Um, actually, there was a correspondence between them, and she saved all the letters. And then the letters went for an auction. And then my producer in the film, the executive producer, who's been supporting financially the film from the beginning, he bought those letters from the auction. So I was actually, I'm actually using a couple of those letters. Great. In okay. the film, which never has been that's, relived. That's another way to get in it. In yes, the yes, yes, yes. And uh, she was a poet. And, uh, but basically there was no footage. So there, because uh, the woman that actually lived in her house, she, you know, she was the one who auctioned the letters and there was nothing else left. Okay. And the other thing is that Shindor actually, he asks his son Mark when he was dying to burn all his correspondence and oh, everything. Really? Yes, all box with everything. And Mark actually did burn them. Oh. Uh, so there was nothing really left on Shinra's side 
uh, of the thing he he received right from yeah. people or from this you know his relationship he had and the only thing actually that I was able to discover are those letters his letters to her because mm-hmm. she saved those which I think was really interesting oh that's that's lovely I, I can't wait to see it <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see it yes we all know these are, are labors of love no yes. one's buying a yacht from yes. these films <laughs> yes. so can people contribute to your effort to try to get the film moving along yes. how can they do that yes that would be fantastic well I created a website which is um called RMS initials of Rudolf Michael Schindler rmsdocumentary.com rmsdocumentary.com okay. yes and there is a page there for donations and actually now I have a fiscal sponsor so if people want to do uh, tax deductible donations All right. that can be done as well oh great um, yes it's been like basically for the last two years I've been supporting the film financially myself and then I did a a fundraiser on Indiegogo, and I was able to collect um, around ten thousand dollars from that. Mm-hmm. And then I had another sponsor, Harriet Hubert, contributed uh, fifteen thousand dollars, which was a very generous donation. And I also have uh, some donation from you guys, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> which is very, very generous too. And uh, so yes, so uh, now I'm in the. We donated in the stage. all of Tom's salary. <laughs> So oh, that's, great. What, that's what it was, Tom. <laughs> Can't wait to see my movie. Yeah, yeah. So now it's like I'm trying the final, final push, basically, to gather the funds, finishing funds for color correction, sound, yeah, to sure. pay for music and all those things to really get the film to screen. It's, it's a hard thing, but I hope that people will respond and, uh, you know, find uh, collaborators to get this done this year. I really hope to finish so it this year. So there could be a premiere here next year. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the place to do it. <laughs> if you're going to do an architecture premiere, you want to do it at Palm Springs during yes, Modernism Week. Yes, yes, Because you'll yes. get no better or receptive yes, audience yes, for that kind yes, of thing. Yes, yes, Thank you so to. much, Valentina, for coming by. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> George Smart was talking with Valentina Geneva, producer of a new documentary on Rudolf Schindler. And now, a moment of reflection from Nietzscheha. Beauty, love, durability, designed to last for years to come, bringing you peace and tranquility. You feel relaxed, knowing your house can easily achieve any exterior look and any color. Wood, concrete, your house loves feeling this good, and you love feeling this good. Nietzsche, 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 say it with me, Nietzsche, advanced engineering. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, durability, textures, finishes, and colors. Visit Nietzsche.com slash U.S. Modernist. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. That's in. I. C. Did you love the movie L.A. Confidential? This classic 90s film of 1940s Los Angeles still holds up beautifully, especially featuring Richard Neutra's Lovell House. Coming up, George visits with the production designer for this film and many others, Janine Oppelwall. Having worked on more than 40 films, she's received four Academy Award nominations for Best Production Design for L.A. Confidential, also Pleasantville, Seabiscuit, and The Good Shepherds. Her films also include Catch Me If You Can, The Big Easy, Bridges of Madison County, Snow Falling on Cedars, and Wonder Boys. She definitely is part of the crowd in Hollywood. Let's go poolside at the U.S. Modernist Compound in Palm Springs. You do have a pretty great sense of humor. Sometimes. Yeah. I saw an interview with you 
where you were just delightful to this host, and but you said that a lot of people don't understand your sense of humor. I, I suspect that that's true. Yeah. What What's it like? That mind inside there. I. You know, I don't know. Things. I don't honestly know. It just the class clown in me emerges periodically, and it sometimes has to do with having people around or people in the audience who've been around me long enough to get what I'm saying. Yeah. And they become filled with glee, and it spreads. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I said something at the uh, one art director's guild event about how I had been the hen in this particular rooster cage for a long time. And I hear three girlfriends of mine sitting in the back who start howling with laughter. (laughs) Oh, sure. (laughs) And it went from there. (laughs) And that's all all you really need is to know that some people got tickled. Some people got it. That's all you can say. (laughs) You know, because I... They understood what I meant exactly. I have been a hen in the rooster cage. And a very well-recognized one. You've, you've got four Academy Award nominations? I do. I do. Yeah, that's pretty special. Um, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I tend not to pay much attention to that stuff. I tend to pay attention to the work. Well, you know, I don't pay attention to to my Academy Award nominations. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I don't pay attention to them at all, but... I'm afraid they might be in the closet getting (laughs) eaten by silverfish. (laughs) So, do you have a collection of gowns that you would... Well, I have two kinds of costumes. Mm -hmm. Work costume and Oscar costumes. That's it. I don't have anything in between. That's... Well, if those are your main venues, you're all set, (laughs) right? um, I have no problem with it. (laughs) And do you go to some of the other ones, like the BAFTAs? No. I don't even, you know, I, I, I don't go any place that I'm not invited, which okay. is to say I think of myself as a member of the working classes of the film business, mm-hmm. which means I there's something in me that rises up at the thought of paying over $1,000 to be admitted to one of these events. I'm, I don't think so. Thank do they you. charge people to go to those? Oh, to the Oscars? Oh, yes. I did not know this. Oh, yes. But then you get those bags, the gift bags. The gift bags don't go to the members of the working classes, darling. <laughs> no, they, they go oh, to the you, celebrity. They don't? No. no. Uh-uh. Okay. I hate to disabuse you of this <laughs> fantasy you're living in. <laughs> yeah, they don't get the uh, iPhones in the silver case at the okay. door when they leave. Darn. Yeah. We used to give away iPhones here, but we had to stop that for budgetary reasons. But Yes, I'm sure the budget's... <laughs> pretty bad probably the people receiving them didn't like having to pay taxes on them either oh Oh. did that happen too oh yes oh yeah oh wow oh yes oh yes you know there are many unexpected not so great outcomes to things which start off as perfectly good intentioned well on game shows when they give away a trip to belize there's often spending money thrown in and that's Possibly meant well, even to cover the, even the, the taxes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there are tax involved. <laughs> if you're getting a ten thousand dollar vacation, you know that's a couple grand. Now right the there IRS in taxes. could look into that if yep. it wished to. Let's put it that way. Right. <laughs> so I want to go back a few years to Bryn Mawr. Oh my God, that's more than a few years. A few that's years? in the Cenozoic era, darling. Ah, I see. Is that when you met Fred Flatstone? Fred, Fla- Fred Flatstone. Fred, Fred, Fred Flintstone. Flintstone. Fred Flintstone. No, no, no. Actually, I met him out, out, out in his favorite lair, which is just outside of Los Angeles in a state park. Oh. That's, oh. that's where a lot of the Flintstone stuff was shot in it. The movie. Within, yeah, I forget yeah. what the name oh. of the state park is, but. That yes. was the one with uh, John Goodman, I think. I can't remember. John Goodman and Elizabeth, not Elizabeth Hurley. Oh, we'll, yeah. we'll figure it out later on. But anyway, at Bryn Mawr, you started discovering Charles and Ray Eames. Not exactly. Okay. I went before Bryn Mawr to a little college in Michigan called Calvin College because my father was a good Dutch Calvinist. I was wondering. So he thought, I should go to this school in Michigan. I'm sure he also thought about that because it was inexpensive as compared to 
some of the other places which accepted me. But at any rate, I was studying the history of art, among other things there, and I had a professor named Edgar Bouvet, history of art, and we used to call him Edgar Groove because uh, he was very groove. <laughs> at any rate, I was sitting in modern art and architecture class, and we were discussing, I don't know, Saarinen, Eames, that group of people. And Edgar Groove said, oh, you know, very near here is this company named Herman Miller in Zealand, and they make the world's most, you know, at the forefront of the world's best modern design and furniture. And the kid sitting next to me, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I guess he knew something about it because it turned out his father was vice president of Herman Miller Furniture Company. So at any rate, we went there on a class trip. And what was great about it is the door opened up, and I took a look, and I thought, oh, What brave new world that has such (laughs) stuff in it. (laughs) (laughs) Crazy good stuff. Crazy great stuff. So that's my introduction to Eames. It turns out that the Duprees, who had, I guess, bought Herman Miller from some relative. I don't know exactly the history of Herman Miller's story. But these were good Dutch Calvinist guys. And what they recognized, not stupidly, they were good businessmen, they recognized that their religious attitude was carefully mimicked in the design philosophy of Charles Eames. Eames' design philosophy was very like Dutch Calvinist idea about clean living. Unadorned, really. Clean living, better living through simplicity, And it all suddenly made a great deal of sense to me. So when I went to California, I wangled a trip to the Eames office as a guest. And on the way out the door, I said to his secretary, you don't have any jobs here, do you? Thinking, buzz off, little girl. You were just the guest. And she stood there, and she looked me up and down a couple of times, and she said, as a matter of fact, we do. I said, well, what would that involve? She said, well, we need someone to curate the book library. And I'm thinking, okay, I can probably handle that. We need somebody to curate the black and white negatives files. And I thought, I can figure that out. Uh, Somebody to curate the slide library. I thought, well, I could figure that out, not having seen how big it was. And she said, I think we also need someone to do some research for Charles because he's been named uh, by Nixon to the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities or the Arts, I forget which. And, oh, by the way, yeah, I think you also have to handle the post-production of the films. And I went, I don't know anything about post-production of films. And I thought, well, I can learn. Yeah. So the first day I was there, you know, after a while of talking to various other people, I called Fred Johnson at Technicolor. And I said, Fred? This is Janine, and I'm trying to take over the post-production of the films for Charles, and I don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) And he said, well, it's okay. He said, and typical for Hollywood, he gave me the directions, and they always start with the following phrase, get into your car. (laughs) 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 He gave me directions to Technicolor. He took me on a whole tour of the Technicolor plant, explained everything I needed to know, writing down. And he said, I'm always have to do this. He said, I'm always happy to do it because my job is so much easier if you know what your job is. Yeah, sure. And I thought, okay. But basically, I mean, I talked to several other people at the Eames office before I spoke to Charles about the job, and they all thought, what Charles thought, but Charles thought it out loud. He said, you don't have the usual background to work here. Mother, you bet I do not. So what would be the usual background? Well, I've gone to design school. Uh-huh. I've not gone to design school. But he said to me, if you can think and you can see, I can teach you how to draw. I wasn't sure I knew what he meant. 
But I lasted there for eight years, so I guess he thought I could think and I could see. It was good enough. Yeah. yeah. And what a thrill to be part of that whole oh, it's creative a, revolution. Yeah, at the time, you know, you're a kid. You don't really know what you're in for. You don't know enough yet about the history or the significance of the place and the relationship and the work. And, you know, it takes time, and pretty soon you understand that you've become part of a family a very interesting people, all of whom inspire each other every day to work longer, work harder, and work better. And that kind of group is really important, especially in film business, because you work and you live and you die according to how well you are functioning with the people around you and how much you can inspire the people around you to do better. So it's that's a family idea that's just stayed with me for a really long time, of course. I still think it's important. <laughs> and you have parlayed that experience into any number of wonderful films. Well, I have to say, when I first left the Eames office and was, after a while, offered a, a job designing a film, I thought, these people in Hollywood are really kind of dumb. They don't even know. I don't have a degree in design. But what you come to realize, of course, is that Hollywood is the one place where a degree will do you no damn good whatsoever. What will do you good is being well-spoken, being respectable, commanding respect, and knowing enough to get by. Yeah. because you can always learn more. And the whole process is always about learning anyway. Every day in the film business is different from the day before, and it's going to be different from the day after, and there's no two days alike, and you have to have the right personality to live happily with that. One of the people that you eventually ran across in your work was Betty Topper. I did? Yep. She owned the Lovell Health House. Oh, I knew a Betty, but I never really fixed on her last name. Yeah, Betty Topper. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yep. Um. <laughs> and, you know... I guess that house is for sale now. It is sort of for sale. Sort they of, are taking sort of bids maybe. on it, yes. Yeah. Mm. She died last year. I heard that, yes. Yes, yeah, so there's a gentleman, Jared Cowan, who asked me to be on his podcast about the house, and I think he was talking with... Uh, Betty's kids or relatives? Just Ken Topper, who is there. Yes, that's it. But I couldn't be there because I was working in New Orleans on a film. So John Panzarella, our location manager from the film, LA Confidential, he went and spoke for all of us and did a brilliant job. I mean, he described how that was the place that Curtis had been thinking about and how we went there and knocked on the door and just were polite and nice and decent and well-behaved and very non-Hollywood. <laughs> and such an exciting film, for one thing. That was one of the ones you were nominated for? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Right. I mean, just the whole vibe of the film, as well as the performances, and then you have these incredible locations that pop up. Yeah, I think that John Panzarella and I spent 10 weeks together in the car, driving around, looking for locations. This is the obvious ones, that is to say the ones that are iconic that everyone knows. And then there's all the other stuff that has to glue those places together in terms of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that stuff is hard to find because... What you're looking for is not just one building. You're looking for an entire environment in which characters can live and breathe and move, and that environment needs to say something about the city. And I was lucky in a way because Curtis Hansen and I both belonged and had belonged for many years to the L.A. Um, Conservancy. Sure. So he had a lot of respect and knowledge of historical architecture in Los Angeles, better than many other directors. And we were able to very quickly arrive at feelings together about what it is we were hoping to find. And finding it, of course, was all those things. It's another whole story. I found that there were, I think when I broke the script down, there were something like 93 sets and locations described. And at the time, is, I... Is that a lot? 
Well, yes, it is a lot. That Usually, you know, like 40, 45, that's about it. But I have done a couple of films with 186. So if I, <laughs> I LA Confidential felt thin to me after I did those. Mm. But now, um, I have to interject this real quick. So yeah. on the other end of the spectrum, how many locations in Bridges of Madison County? That seems pretty That's low. That's like, I don't know, five or six? Five. <laughs> <laughs> what about that movie where James Franco stuck with his arm in the rock? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One, location, one location. One big Trying rock. Right. One big place, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. So okay. 90 Keep going. some odd locations. Yeah, yeah, so what I realized was that it was very difficult to keep in my head all the time what we were looking for. So for weeks, I drove around with little post-its on the dashboard of my car. Name of the set, short description of the set, description of the action required by the script. And I actually found places by just keeping that in my head all the time. I would drive down some street I hadn't driven down Hollywood area before, and i go, oh! That looks like it could be four. Right. Stop the car, jump out, and go look. All right. Hello, John Panzarella. Can you please check out this building at 1922, whatever the street is? <laughs> right. And actually, one of the harder things to find was the Pot Bust Movie Theater, which was a tower. And that's not a movie theater. Uh-huh. That was... An Art Deco post office, abandoned as a post office and occupied, I think, by some design architecture firm at the time. And I found that because I was on a date with a guy and we'd been downtown and we'd been listening to music and we were going to eat some dinner in some place he knew in Hollywood and the freeway was Kel Surprise jammed. Yeah. So we jumped off <laughs> at a location on a street we didn't usually take, and it was Hollywood Boulevard, and we were driving down Hollywood Boulevard, and I felt this big tower go by. And then I looked <laughs> on the other side, and I saw there was a T intersection right at that tower. And I started shouting at him, Stop the car! Stop the car! <laughs> and he didn't know what had happened, so we pulled over, and I jumped out of the car, and I went running up the block, and I saw that there were at least two or three buildings which could possibly be the apartment for the pot bust. And I stood back and I looked at the tower and I thought, yeah, there used to be a whole chain of theaters in Los Angeles called the Tower Movie Theaters. They were pretty much gone. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, now all I have to do is, you know, add some signage and change this piece of Hollywood Boulevard and... Oh, yes, turn it into a movie theater with a big neon marquee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Piece of cake, right? Well, actually, <laughs> the most comical aspect of it all was that we were not allowed, for good reasons, to tie into the building with our marquee. Usually you hang it off. It's a three the side. Yeah, you hang right. it off the sides. And I thought, well, we can't tie into the building, so that means it has to be a three-sided structure, it's triangular, it's more stable than something just plastered on the front. And I can figure out how to design pilasters to cover the poles that are holding the thing up, two legs holding it up in the back against the building. Mm -hmm. The problem comes at the nose cone right. at the street. And I thought, you know, I said, okay, I'll just put two poles there and I'll paint them black and I'll go to the director and I'll say, you see those two poles? Park extras in front of them. I can't <laughs> do anything else. And we had one day to install it, one day to shoot it, and one day to get it off the sidewalk. Wow. So as we were finishing shooting, my team was rolling up with the vehicle to disassemble the neon. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. It is pretty crazy. It's pretty yeah. crazy. Now, these days, what kind of films are you working on and, and what are some of the architectural styles that you're dealing with? Well, I just finished a film with a director named Adrian Line. Oh, sure. And we worked on a film based on a Patricia Highsmith novel. You know, her novels like uh, Talented Mr. Ripley, they're about mm -hmm. overeducated, uh, messed up people. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we went to New Orleans and found a lot of very interesting locations for the film there. 
I looked at a lot of houses for the main character's house, and I'm always searching for something which has poetry in it and speaks to me personally and whispers, you know, take me, take me, I want to be in your movie. Right, like puppies at the pound. Yeah, it's there's something in you that has a feeling for the architecture and what it would mean. And when I walked into this house, it had clearly been a somewhat fixed, older New Orleans, small plantation-style house with a big dependency in the back and big columns and raised up, you know, a story off the ground. When I walked in, the guy who was what I belonged to had certain kind of very odd and very interesting taste in furniture, very spare, very almost nothing there. And he had not restored the floors. They were original cypress, and he had done nothing to them. No one had done anything to them. And I just looked at the floors, and I looked at the quality of the unfinishedness of the place, and I thought, yep, just like our character. Can't finish a darn thing. <laughs> That's the one we ended up shooting in. So there's always you didn't something. have to recreate the unfinished. Well, there were. I didn't have to recreate a lot of the unfinishedness. I had to add to it. And of course, the script spoke about a living room, a dining room, and a kitchen off the dining room. And of course, that was that's never the layout of those kinds of houses. The kitchen is in the dependency because that's long Southern tradition, so you don't burn down the house. The you just burn down oh, is the, the back dependency right. in the back. I didn't know right? that's what it was called, but yeah, I know it was Yeah, that's what it's called. So we had to clear out one area and build a kitchen in it. And, uh, you know, probably looks just like I did nothing because the job of a yeah. designer is to design, in film at least, is to design yourself into anonymity. Right. So that no, you don't stand there and wave your hands and say, look, ma, no hands. I'm doing this great job. No, your job is to disappear into the mechanics of the story. Right. To tell the story honestly and directly and emotionally. And to make the audience feel like they're just eavesdropping. Uh, so it's, that's the late, that's the th I finished that Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and flew right here. I flew home. That's two hours in Santa Monica, and then I drove Sunday morning. After Saturday, making a list of everything that's gone wrong in the house for the six months while I was gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in your Calling house? Calling the handyman. Oh, okay. Here you go. This has got to be fixed. That's got to be fixed. This piece of the roof is falling apart. The chandelier is broken. Get busy. I'll be back in a week. <laughs> that's life. That is life, being on the road that much. Yeah, that's the way it is. How many days a year are you on the road? Well, it's highly variable. Yeah. I mean, this year it's been, you know, six months plus whatever personal expeditions I take because I really, when I'm not working, I like to go, as I call it, chase architecture. Yeah. And I take trips somewhere where I think I want to look at buildings and get food from them. And I didn't start working until August this year. And I just finished. So that's enough, basically. That's six yeah. months for one year. That's enough for me. You can take a little break now. I'm, I hope I can, although someone was offering me a job, and I have to go back and think about it. Do I want to do this or not? I don't know. Well, Janine, we're really lucky to catch you here between jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yes, between right. jobs. <laughs> and, and thanks for coming and joining us here at the Skylark. Okay. Right. It's a pleasure to hear your story and the story of your working on the house from L.A. Confidential, because that's one of our favorites. That's one of your favorites. Okay. Yeah. Well, And to know that there are people that appreciate the work you do, even if it's not in your face obvious. Well, you know, when I gave my talk yesterday, I was very much surprised at how many people were laughing and clapping and clearly enjoying themselves. Yeah. And, you know, after all, I tell people, this is the entertainment business. If you are not entertaining and you are working in the film business, you are, you better look for something, yeah, something else wrong to with you. do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's very important. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you. That was celebrated production designer Janine Oppelwall, who spoke at Modernism Week on mid-century design on the big screen. 
Have you ever been watching a film and gotten distracted by the gorgeous chair or carpet or a dining table? Paula Benson sure has. She's the creative director and furniture fanatic co-founder of Film and Furniture, a blog that showcases the furniture, decor, and home accessories in movies and where to purchase them. We join Paula Poolside in Palm Springs. So, Paula. Hello. What's the first piece of furniture that you found yourself fixating on? Mm-hmm. Like that the jumped out of the screen, regardless of what the characters were doing and the mu- music was playing and the background scenery and the, and the sets, what furniture said, hello? <laughs> furniture and decor and films have always caught my attention. Um, you know, I'm a nightmare to watch films with because I'm always, you know, putting on pause, analyzing what I'm looking at in the film and working out what hidden messages. Um, but I think it was um, what really took hold was a, a few years ago. I was revisiting The Shining, Kubrick's The Shining, mm-hmm. um, and that hexagonal carpet from the Overlook Hotel, the orange, brown, and red hexagonal carpet. I was just thinking that's such an amazing carpet, and it's been referenced and parodied in so many different films and different merchandise. So I was thinking, who, who, no one talks about who designed this piece of carpet. No one talks about you know why it was chosen. So I started to do a lot of research and that took me down a rabbit warren of <laughs> conspiracy theories which is quite typical for Kubrick movies so that, yeah, that, sure. <laughs> that was the carpet uh, it was that carpet that, that really kind of kicked it all off and I wrote a big article about it which went pretty much viral around the world and the, the Film and Furniture website was built around this fascination of realising that there were other people as obsessed with these details in film as I am really so where did this carpet come from? Tell us. Well, it turns out, I mean, I had the, the, there's an amazing Kubrick archive over in London when he died. The London College of Communication took over all his notes and he was, you know, crazy about keeping everything and um, cataloguing everything. But they were going through all the notes of the Kubrick archive for me trying to find out, but they couldn't find any reference particularly to the carpet. And then I realized that um, it already existed. It it was designed by David Hicks, who is a very influential British designer working 60s, 70s and 80s. He was kind of called the Prince of Pattern. So he had designed the carpet and I managed to track down the original license holders of the carpet. And um, yeah, now we work with them to reproduce the carpet for the general public. Okay. So then people could buy it. That's right. Yes, and they have been. (laughs) Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there's lots of merchandise out there, but we're talking of what we produce are kind of really beautiful, luxury, well-made, you know, uh, wool carpets and rugs, and we can make it to any size. So we've, yeah, we carpeted an entire hotel in Alaska at the top of a, a snowy mountain last year, and we've got lots of people all around the world who want the original proper, you know, officially licensed version. So, yeah, yeah, that's taken us on all sorts of journeys. And I guess this goes into different genres as well. Like, do you have fans of sci-fi that are looking for a particular object? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot in sci-fi, actually. We talk a lot about sci-fi, and I've got a particular sort of penchant towards dystopian <laughs> futures. So, um, yeah, and there are, there are many, uh, actually some very ancient, old objects that crop up in futuristic films as well. So 2001 A Space Odyssey is the other Kubrick movie, the the red gin chairs that appear in um, Space Station 5 is uh, another object we've managed to track down some originals and we we sell those a lot. But I mean, we we discuss basically in the website, you know, why it was chosen for the scene, what hidden messages are there. Sometimes, you know, these objects can tell us more than the plot and the dialogue, Um, especially if you're someone like me who actually loses the plot because I'm analysing the film set. You've fallen down the rabbit hole (laughs) with the rabbits. Yeah, I'm there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm there. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, then I realised, you know, there's plenty of people who will just Google, you know, what is that chair in Alien Covenant or what is that wallpaper mm-hmm. in Phantom Menace or, you know, what are those lights in Ex Machina and, you know, we'll, we'll tell them what they are and wh- why they were chosen and we talk to the production designers and the set decorators and get all the hidden meanings or why things were chosen because but it's always you know fascinating the reason they were chosen even if it's only on screen for a split second yeah all that research that's gone into why it was chosen are there any of these objects, particularly of furniture, that just 
don't exist. They're they're CGI or something that someone assembled out of cardboard that are not really real. Yes, yes. And especially a lot more now with CGI and 3D printing. Even I was talking to a production designer recently who was working on a war movie and he was getting huge, you know, real-sized tanks were being 3D printed. So they'd be printed for the movie and then destroyed afterwards. But, you know, it's interesting that when you look at something like... Um, Parasite that won all those amazing awards recently in the Oscars and so forth that absolutely everything was custom designed for that entire set that beautiful house in Parasite was all completely built specifically for filming so everything in that house was designed specifically for the film but you know things are still made but some of it is CGI it's um, yeah. it depends on the method of the of the director and the production designer I remember this is going way back in the original Star Trek mm mm-hmm. There was one of the episodes, I think it was in the cheesy third season, (laughs) when they were just hanging on after the fans had brought it back for a final run, where there were these medallions in the episode, and they were called IDIC medallions. And it stood for, I believe, infinite diversity and and infinite combinations. (laughs) And at the time, this caused some sort of sensation. Everyone wanted one of these IDIC medallions. But they didn't exist. They were just a little thing that one of the people had made. And I don't know if they ever went into production or somebody licensed them from Paramount. But do you see things like that, that just kind of oddball stuff that becomes popular? Yeah, well, I follow a lot of the auction sites and these things do, you know, pop up, whether they were screen used or just, you know, production tests or whatever. Yeah, they, they do pop up on auction sites from time to time. But there's always somebody out there that will have remade them that will have formed their own moulds and made them in small runs to make, to make them available. If there's, if there's somebody who wants them, there'll be somebody out there who's making them, whether it's official or not. But, you know, it's great to keep that sort of fandom alive, I think. Oh, yeah. Now, you've been so successful with the blog and, and your business and the consulting that you do, which is really devoted. I mean, you have put a lot into this. I'm glad you noticed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a high bar to reach. But I wonder about the people that are at the next highest bar, which have converted their home into some sort of movie set. Mm. Do you run across that where they've recreated? I've not been in direct contact with anybody who's recreated an entire set at home. But there are lots of people who, um, you know, want to surround themselves with things from their favorite movies. Movies. So so I, I did a custom rug for a guy recently in California. Um, the Shining Rug, and I asked him to send me a photo of it in place at home in his study. And then when he sent it through to me, I realised this was just one movie reference in a room just full of references to to Blade Runner and sci-fi and Star Wars and The Shining and all sorts of things. He just wanted to Mm -hmm. surround himself with things that, you know, that he knew and loved from movies. But I've never, I haven't come across anyone who's devoted an entire house to a particular set. But um, I know, again, back in the the Star Trek genre, Mm. there are a couple people who have created... Star Trek bridge scenes in their apartment or house, or there's a guy in upstate New York who's created a whole complex, like an almost entire starship with the transporter room and the engine bay and everything, and people go through it to see it. And he's got one of the most astonishing collections Mm. of both original Mm. and reproduction paraphernalia, Mm. so that he's tried to do what Disney is now doing with their Star Wars experience, Hotel. I assume you've heard about this in Florida? Yes, I don't know a lot about it, but I've heard about it, yeah. Yeah. So in Florida, when you check into the new Star Wars hotel, you are on a space cruiser, which is pretty immersive. Yeah. And you don't leave the hotel to go to the park. You get on these special shuttles that you don't see the outside. And you're flying through space to get to the Star Wars Yeah. Park. So it's really a two day mission yeah. <laughs> that's been accomplished in all this. I love it. And that kind of immersion is, I guess, one of the next frontiers of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whether it's physical or a VR. Yeah, I've been I've been talking a lot about how, you know, I think it would be amazing to do a lot more VR on set. I mean, it's kind of done by the promotion and the marketing department. So maybe you've got a little three D experience to when a film is launched where you can have a, a walk around someone's house or an apartment. But I think that's the next stage is to be able to actually walk around a room and sit in that chair and, 
you know, to play the music that that protagonist has been yeah. listening to. And, you know, I, I love this idea of immersiveness. And I was reading recently that I don't think you, you have it here, but in the, in the UK, there's something called Secret Cinema. And for years, they've recreated sort of live experiences where you're uh, referencing the film sets and they re- rebuild a lot of the film sets and you're able to walk around and mm. um, be entertained and then and th- but normally y- you know that you don't really know h- how it's going to come out when you when you get there but and they do it brilliantly it's really it's a really authentic experience and quite surprising but I read recently that they've just done a deal with Disney oh well you know we have things in New York and LA called pop-ups that they do for the Seinfeld show and I think they do for friends, where they'll have the apartment, yeah, and you can go through, and yeah. or you can recreate the fountain scene, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, get on the couch in the fountain, yeah, yeah. And then for years there was I don't know if it's still going on or not. There was the Seinfeld tour in New York City, which you could get on with Kenny Kramer, who was the real person that the character Kramer was based on. And then he would take you around on this odyssey mm. of all the places that mm. were featured in the TV show, yep. ending up at the Soup Nazis little <laughs> soup stand, which I must say does have the best soup you have ever consumed <laughs> okay. in your life. It is Need absolutely fabulous. That. And it's still there. Next time you're in New York, yes. just look it up. Yeah, I will. Well, I'm over in New York actually in in May, giving a talk at the Museum of Moving Image because they have the 2001 Kubrick exhibition there at the moment. Okay. And we have a gin chair, which is on loan to them at the moment. They, they wanted our chair because it's covered in pink. Ah. So I don't know if you can recall this scene where Dr. Floyd walks into the space station and you see all these red chairs, gin chairs with Saarinen, well, actually, they're not Saarinen, but Saarinen-esque white tables but we did a lot of research on that as well, and we realised actually those chairs, which everyone thinks are red, are actually a little bit more pink or magenta than you might think. Mm. So um, we know someone who has a lot of the original 1960s airborne chairs from, from the original shells. They have to be recovered for, you know... I guess everything does eventually. Yeah. Safety, fire precautions, these sorts of things. Anyway, yeah. by, by law they have to be. So uh, we had ours recovered in pink. Um, so now it's, you know, it's been off in the official... Deutsche Museum in, in Germany, and now it's currently in the, in the Momi Museum in New York. So we're going over there to give a talk, basically, about is this chair red or is it pink? Ah, well, that's a good museum topic, I think. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. You should give out little color swatches to the audience. Yes. So they can be eyeballing, yes. you know, and voting. It's like, what was that thing on the internet a couple of years ago about the dress? You know, what color was the dress? Was it gold or was it... Yellow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could do that as part of the talk. <laughs> yep, I'll do that. Get a lot of social media mileage out of that one. <laughs> yes. So your talk here in Palm Springs, tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, Frances Anderton from KCRW interviewed me a little while ago. She discovered film and furniture herself and wanted to know more. And I'd spoken with her before saying that I really wanted to come over to Modernism Week. So when she was asked to suggest someone to interview... During Modernism Week, she very kindly suggested me, and it's been, honestly, it's a dream come true to be here. I've been, for one reason or another, I've not been able to make it in the past. So when Mark and Francis asked me to do this talk, it was an absolute uh, pleasure. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about some of my favourite objects and a whole mixture of films from 2001 and The Shining that we just talked about through to Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049. We'll touch a bit on Mad Men, you know, a few things with a nod to modernism, but not ne- not necessarily modernist. But yeah, I'll be talking a whistle stop tour, and then Francis and I will probably sit down and have a chat about a few more favourite objects in films. I know this is probably not an easy question to answer, but what tends to be the most iconic object in films? You know, when I think of it, I think of something like maybe. Back in the day, it was the Maltese falcon, the actual little falcon object. But what about today? What, what is really grabbing people iconically? In general? Yeah. In, I think it may be chairs. Chairs, chairs. chairs always tell a story, don't they? Yeah. You know, when you see a character walk into their apartment, whether they have a Mies van der Rohe Barcelona chair or they have some flea-bitten sort of chair, you immediately know something about their character. So I think chairs say... An awful lot about character. Do you remember in Up, where the, the old man and the old woman were sitting in their two chairs side by side, and they sort of very subtly echoed their two personalities and, mm-hmm. their, and their two looks? And I think a chair is a nice way 
especially in film or in um, photography, of, of framing a person. So I think chairs are always a really, a really interesting way of discovering more about of a character in a very subtle way. Maybe that should be on dating site profiles. Yes. You know, what chair do you sit, sit in, in most of the time? <laughs> yes. Right? Please send me a picture of your chair. Because <laughs> yeah. I think for a while the dating sites were talking about shoes. Women wanted to see what shoes men wore as a gauge of whether or not to go out with them or not. Yeah. So now it can shift to chairs. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the Matrix chair, how famous that was. But I think that would be quite funny on a dating site, wouldn't it? If it was a sort of flea-bitten old lounge chair. Or... Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lazy boy, right, with a crank on the side <laughs> and, a, and a beer holder, you know, is one sort of personality. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or a Barcelona day bed that you must stay pristinely <laughs> sat at right angles at all times. Right. <laughs> You can only nap for 12 minutes because you cannot sleep any more yeah. than that. Yeah. Or a Florence Knoll sofa, which I always, you know, for years thought that looked too pristine to sit in. I was in the Knoll showroom a few years ago. Oh, God, it's so comfortable. I couldn't move. You know, it looks much more harder than it really is. It's a beautifully designed chair. Yeah. You know, so they were all over Mad Men. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a mid-century production mm. designer's dream. Absolutely. And I think, it, I think, actually, it's got a lot to do with, you know, where we're here now. That whole kind of interest in, in mid-century modern, I think it had a big part to play in putting it um, back on the map. Because I can remember growing up where there was a time where this stuff was all considered crap. Mm. And, and, you know, people mm. just didn't want it. Mm. And why would you keep that old thing? Yeah. That thing that looks like a womb or a circle or a <laughs> whatever a, yeah. it's like something a cranky 80 year old man would go oh, what kind of crap is that <laughs> exactly but i think now because you know in the crazy digital age we live in we're all kind of looking for a sense of something authentic and something real and i think uh, mid-century modern furniture and design represents to a lot of people because it's it's well generally very well made it's made to last so it's a real craft there yeah and then it also obviously hints at the past a perhaps a rosier time you know although not necessarily but that's the way we see it now so i think in this crazy fast digital era there's something about mid-century modern because of the craft ethic and looking back that makes it sort of feel very warm and authentic I tell people all the time that the Eames chair Mm. is the button-down shirt of furniture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just been around a long time. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. still popular. People look good in it. Yes. Men and women both. Yes, yes. The lounge chair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just very enduring. Yes, absolutely, yeah. What's on the horizon in furniture? What's going to be the next big thing? (laughs) Um, Do you know the funny thing is, is that I don't really follow trends. I never have. So I think, um, you know, it's whatever stands out. The Kanye West sofa bed, perhaps? (laughs) I will not be paying attention to that, whatever it is. Unless it features in a film, and then my ears will prick up. Uh, Okay, very good. (laughs) I'm sure it will feature in a film if we have the Kanye West sofa bed coming out. (laughs) Yeah. I go to a lot of the trade shows, and there's still very, really strong nods to mid-century and everything, I think. The brass kind of gold look is still really strong. I would have thought that might have um, dropped off by now, but no, and uh, that's still very strong. And also really bright patterned mixed textiles, kind of a a bolder, colourful look, I think, is coming through in a really strong way as well. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming and spending some time here at the swanky Hotel Skylark poolside. You're very welcome. (laughs) Lovely to be here. Enjoy your time here in Palm Springs. Thank you. I will. Cheers. That was Paula Benson of Film and Furniture, wrapping up our series on modernism in the movies. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned as we bring more shows from 2020's Modernism Week in Palm Springs. You want to hang out with us at the swanky U.S. Modernist Compound at Modernism Week in February 2021? Email george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist is underwritten by Nichiha.com slash U.S. Modernist and by Angela Roll, your special agent for Modernist Houses, 919-995-0550. All right, take us out, George. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to our past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 significant modernist houses, and access over 2.8 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. 
U.S. Marnish Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studio in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by me and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarina researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, a chainsaw, and salsa dancing with husband Adam. U.S. Marnish Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm George Smart, and there's no Frank Sinatra tune I won't dance to by his pool in Palm Springs. We'll be back soon with another Fly Me to the Moon, The Way You Look Tonight, I've Got You Under My Skin edition of U.S. Marnish Radio. Cheers. <laughs>